Good afternoon. My name is Hallie Leinhardt, Outreach Specialist at the Center for Financial Security at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Lower Interest for Timely Payments, a Field Experiment on Incentives for Loan Repayment. Our presenters today are George Hofheimer, Chief Research and Innovation Officer at the Filene Research Institute. Filene developed um, sorry, Filene developed the Lower Interest for Timeliness, or LIFT, project. Justin Sidnor is Assistant Professor in the Department for Actuarial Science, Risk Management, and Insurance at the Wisconsin School of Business, and is a faculty affiliate of the Center for Financial Security. Leah Jertsen is the Senior Research Assistant at the Center for Financial Security. The Center for Financial Security acted as evaluator of the LIFT project. Josh Sledge is the Manager of Nonprofit Investments for the Center for Financial Security Innovation. CFSI funded the LIFT project through their Financial Cap Capability Innovation Fund. And just a reminder before we get started with presentations, to submit questions to be answered in the question and answer portion that will take place in the last 15 minutes of the webinar, please click on the Ask a Question icon located in the bottom right corner of your screen and submit your question. And with that, I will turn it over to George Hoffheimer. Great. Thanks a lot. And uh, welcome, everyone, to today's webinar. We're really pleased with the turnout that we have, uh, which I think indicates the interest level of this really interesting innovation. Um, on my first slide, just a real brief introduction to who we are uh, and what we do at Spleen. We're a nonprofit, independent think and do tank, uh, which means that uh, about half of our work is focused in on uh, research um, and research around the consumer finance industry. And then um, uh, the other half is focused on doing stuff with that research. And uh, the example that we're going to talk about today, the LIST project, um, is definitely on the do side. Um, you know, uh, the, the concept that, that research can, can get you only so far and we need to actually test things in the marketplace. And um, that's what we're going to talk about today. This is one of the, the ideas uh, that we've been testing over the past several years. Um, we're based in Madison, Wisconsin, right down the street from the University of Wisconsin, and uh, very pleased to be partnering with the Center for Financial Services Innovation and the University of Wisconsin-Madison on this important project. Um, if you could advance to the ne next slide uh, entitled uh, Lift Introduction, just to kind of give you a sense of where this idea came from. And um, the, the idea came from a, a group that we called I3, which is an acronym that stands for Ideas, Innovation, and Implementation. And this uh, group is made up of credit union executives from across the U.S. and Canada uh, that, are, uh, uh, that essentially go through an innovation curriculum. We teach them how to innovate within the confines of a regulated industry uh, like banking. Uh, and every six months uh, through a cycle, uh, they get together in small teams and come up with ideas. Some of these ideas uh, don't go anywhere. Uh, some of the ideas are interesting, uh, but there's no interest in the marketplace for them to go uh, anywhere. And then a small percentage of them uh, actually kind of fit in that sweet spot of, hey, this is an interesting idea. Uh, there's uh, interest from a consumer side, and there's also interest from the financial institution side to test these ideas further. And that's exactly um, what we found with this project called LIFT. And LIFT is another acronym that stands for lowest, Lower Interest for Timely Payments. And um, a group of credit union executives came up with this idea, which I'll explain in a little bit uh, greater detail on the next slide. Um, and uh, had a, a six-month testing window to uh, come up with the idea, uh, test it on a very small scale, uh, and then report the results. And uh, the results were, were interesting. There was what we like to call evidentiary support, not academic uh, ironclad support that this concept actually works, uh, but support that, hey, um, this idea uh, called LIFT was a promising innovation. Um, so the next step was to figure out, well, how can we test this further? And since we're a smaller nonprofit, uh, we reached out to the organization uh, that you'll hear from a little bit later, Center for Financial Services Innovation, and obtained a grant for them to determine the feasibility and the viability of this idea. Um, and if we go to the next slide, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about what this idea is. Um, and um, I know that our friends from the UW uh, Center for Financial Security are going to go into a little bit more detail about this. But essentially, the, the concept was this. The, the group of credit union executives that came, with it, came up with this idea uh, recognized that one of the the assumptions about uh, the procurement of risk uh, to consumers is that the higher the risk of default, the higher cost of credit. Yeah, it's, a, it's a very simple relationship that people within the industry call risk-based pricing. Essentially, 
people through some of the, the loan scoring models that, that almost every financial institution works with identifies someone that has a higher risk of default, um, of course you're going to offer um, a higher cost of credit. Now, uh, inherent in this, uh, there, there are a lot of uh, questions about, well, if the person has a higher risk of default and you, you have them have a higher cost of credit, won't that further increase their, their risk of default? So this was the problem that the, the group of credit union executives were playing around with. And they came up with this idea. If you go to the next slide, um, that's actually a picture of me, um, is the insight from uh, years and years of experience of providing lending services to all types of consumers is that, uh, if you look on the left-hand side, you see a picture of a person with a paper bag over their head, and even though they have a C paper profile, a good proportion of people with C paper profile actually have A paper performance, meaning that uh, on paper people seem to have a higher risk, but their um, their actions in terms of paying back loans, like auto loans or mortgage loans or other types of consumer loans, um, actually showed that they paid it on time, and um, you know then shouldn't they be rewarded? That was the, the, the concept uh, with Lyft. And if you go to the next slide, the one with uh, the picture of the carrot and the stick, is this concept that the Lyft provides more carrot and less stick by rewarding on-time loan repayment. So um, the, our, our friends from the UW are going to explain um, in, in greater detail specifically what this idea is about. But the concept behind it was, wouldn't it be great if we can offer a loan to people that have a little bit lower credit scores um, and then provide an incentive, a positive incentive for them to pay their loan on time. And we'll go into a little bit de more detail about how that actually played out um, with this test. But that's generally the concept, trying to turn the, the, the traditional lending, risk-based lending program on its head and looking at people that have less than stellar credit and providing them incentives to pay on time and as a result, get um, better uh, pricing on their loans. So that's where I'm going to stop the story right now. I'm going to revisit you a little bit later after uh, the folks from UW have the chance to kind of talk through the experiment and give you some uh, insights that we garnered uh, outside uh, of the results. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Justin and Leah uh, from uh, the UW uh, Center for Financial Security. So thank you, and I'll talk to you in a, in a little while. Thank you, George. So I will start kind of the research portion of the webinar by presenting how the LIFT project was uh, designed and implemented, um, how the data was collected, and describing a little bit about uh, the population sample. I'm then going to turn it over to Justin Sidner, who will present preliminary results and discuss some of the implications. Next slide, please. So LIFT, or lower interest for timeliness, is our target population here are auto loan borrowers with subprime credit that are taking loans from credit unions. And this particular project is a randomized controlled trial, so borrowers were randomly assigned to a treatment group that received the Lyft product or a control group that just uh, did their loan as usual at that credit union. Uh, next slide. So again, our project partners here are CFSI, Filene, and the Center for Financial Security as the evaluation partner. Uh, go ahead to the next slide. So the motivation here was really, can we design a product that improves the financial capability of consumers while also being attractive to the financial services industry? Uh, so in today's marketplace, consumers have kind of, they have a lot of demands for both their time and attention, and there are a lot of reasons that someone may make a loan payment late, including self-control, a lack of attention, or not neglecting or not kind of understanding what the future consequences are of making a late payment. So the incentive, the rate incentive here, could act by focusing uh, borrower's attention on this particular payment so that they make it on time. Next slide. Um, so not only would the borrower then receive the initial reward of the reduced interest rate on that particular auto loan, but also over time as they um, make payments in a timely manner that can improve their credit score. So the graph here from um, myfico.com shows that approximately 35% of a consumer's credit score um, it comes from their payment history. So borrowers, especially those that started um, with, with a smaller credit history, could build their credit score by paying on time. Next slide. So how did the Lyft uh, project work? So 
the lower entry interest for timeliness went for every three consecutive payments that a borrower made on time, they had an, an interest rate reduction of 25 basis points or a quarter of a percent. Now, the way that it worked in this pilot is that that did not reduce the monthly payment, but it went to the principal of the loan and shortened the life of the loan so that it was paid off sooner. Next slide. So we had five credit unions that participated in this pilot, and as you can see from the picture here, we have some geographic diversity. We have credit unions kind of placed across the country that were participating in the LIFT project. Next slide. So how was the project designed? So we start at the time of loan application, and during the study period, all the borrowers at the credit unions um, applying for a loan received a basic brochure that just explained the benefits of paying on time, um, how it could improve their credit score, and that was to kind of set just a baseline level of information about how timely payments improves your credit. Now, after the loan was originated, it was at that point that loans were randomly assigned to either the treatment group or the control group. Now, the treatment group received, we wanted to be sure that they were aware of the LIFT project uh, or the LIFT product, how it worked and what the benefits were. So credit unions communicated with the LIFT borrowers both through a phone call um, and then also through a letter. And then to reduce any concerns that our, the control group borrowers um, may, any kind of effect that we would see was really just um, kind of a reminder or communication with the credit union. We also sent a series of communications to the control borrowers, um, similar to the brochure that reminded them to pay on time and thanked them for having a loan with that credit union. Uh, we then used the credit union's payment tracking data to observe each of the loans for 12 months. Um, at the close of this 12-month period, a survey was sent out to all the borrowers, both treatment and control groups, to get some additional information. Next slide. So again, our data sources here that we're reporting from are both the borrower survey that was sent after 12 months of having the auto loans, and then the loan payment data that the credit unions use to track their loans. Next slide. So the borrower survey was a paper survey that was mailed to all project auto loan borrowers. The response rate that we got was about 36%, and we did see a similar response rate across the treatment or lift borrowers and the control borrowers. We used this information um, to look at population demographics, to understand awareness of the lift product, and also some financial behaviors and attitudes. Next slide. The loan payment data, across the five sites, we have a final sample of 880 loans. And of those loans, 453 were treatment group that were assigned to receive the LIFT product. And 427 were control group loans who just had their loan serviced as usual at that credit union. We use this information to look at interest rate reductions, late payments, and also um, whether the loans ever entered a default status. Next slide. So um, I'll share a few, few graphs here that look at, so who is in this sample and kind of just describing um, our population. So while our mean age or the average age of the borrowers is about 42 years old, you can see that we really have borrowers from across the life course represented here, including almost 10% of the borrowers that are uh, age 65 or older. Next slide. Uh, so similar to kind of the demographics of credit union membership in general, the majority of our sample is Caucasian with um, both African American and Hispanic borrowers each representing less than 20% of our LIFT sample. Uh, next slide. And then education attainment. Um, so the most common response um, on the survey item asking about how much education the borrower had was that at least some college, and that was just over 40%. It's also worth noting that our sample was evenly split across men and women, and that about half the sample reported being married. Next slide. We wanted to get a sense of what kind of the financial lives of, this, um, of, the, of these consumers looked like. Uh, and so we asked a few questions that looked over, asking them to think about the last year, um, whether they had kind of uh, how they made ends meet and some of the financial services that they used. So almost 35% reported having difficulty meeting monthly expenses. 
um, over a third also reported experiencing an unexpected drop in income within the last year. Um, high rates are also um, having trouble paying medical bills. They're borrowing from friends and family. Um, and just under 20% borrowed at least once from an alternative form of credit. And so this could include a pawn shop, a payday loan, or an auto title loan. So this is in addition to the auto loan that they have with the credit union. Next slide. So a really key thing is understanding were borrowers aware of the LIFT program? Because we'd only expect them to respond by increasing their likelihood of paying on time if they understood what the incentive was and how it worked. So we used the survey to kind of get a sense of the level of this awareness. When we asked borrowers, has your interest rate changed on your auto loan? We had almost half of the Lyft group saying that they did have a change in their interest rate over the time period. Then we asked if their loan had a feature that reduced the interest rate. Here we had about 40% or 41% of the sample saying that their loan did have a feature uh, that reduce interest rate for paying on time. So this um, makes us think that about 40% of the sample, if we can think about the survey sample kind of broadly representing, uh, to the extent that it can broadly represent the project sample as a whole, about 40% of our LIFT borrowers were aware of the LIFT program and how it worked. When we asked about the program by name, not just um, kind of the function, only 20% and then only 16% of the treatment sample recognized that their loan was actually a lift loan. Another thing that we wanted to kind of check on was the rates of using auto payment. Um, prior to the, the beginning of the study, one thought was that how people might respond to an incentive like the lift that rewarded paying on time is they may be more likely to opt in to using an auto payment. Um, this appears to not be the case as almost identical rates of treatment and control borrowers report using an auto payment feature. Next slide. So another thing that we wanted to get a sense of was just how borrowers felt about the credit union. So here we used a scale of eight items that talked about, that asked about the likelihood of using that credit union again in the future, of recommending it to a family or friend, whether they felt the prices were fair, whether they trusted the credit union, and we summed these items together into a scale. And when we look at the responses, the responses of the lift group are slightly more positive than of the control group. And this is a, di a difference that is statistically significant. So it does appear that the lift borrowers have more positive feelings about the credit union. Next slide. So we, it's also important to understand kind of the financial circumstances and then particularly the loans that are at issue here. So our average annual income of our borrowers is about $47,300, and about 40% are homeowners. Um, when we ask about checking accounts, only 80% of the sample is banked, uh, meaning that 20% of the sample are paying, are paying their auto loans with another financial service. And our average credit score here is 643, which is a subprime credit score. Uh, so the loans at issue, at the time that the loan was taken out, our average loan amount was $11,200, and our initial interest rate was 11%. Next slide. And so here is the, you can see that there is kind of a range of interest rates by the credit unions. All Of all the loans in the sample, the interest ranged from just above 4% to 20% APR, and there is some variation by credit union. Um, next slide. So I'm now going to turn it over to Justin Sidner, so he'll be talking about the preliminary results and then also the implications. Thank you very much, Leah. So uh, I get the fun job of telling you finally whether or not it worked. Uh, so we had a lot of build up to get to there. So what we're going to be looking at here is on a couple of different outcome measures, whether it looks like the group who was randomly offered the LIFT program performed differently than the control group. And so what you see on this slide is that in the first row, we show the fraction who ever got a rate reduction. Uh, so for the lift group, that was 73%. So almost three-fourths of them went at least one three-month period where they paid consistently on time. Now, of the control group, it's zero. Now, that doesn't mean none of them were paying on time, but it's actually a good check that the program was working right. So none of them saw their interest rates lowered, and they shouldn't have because they were in the control group. 
Now, among the Lyft group, uh, on average, people saw 1.3 rate reductions, meaning that you know over the course of a first year of, of observing these folks, the average person paid on time for it for a little more than one three-month stint, but not quite two. Uh, among those who ed, who ever had at least a rate one rate reduction, we see 1.7 average rate reductions, meaning they almost went two of these three month cycles. Now, the first real result we have, you can see on the bottom row in this table. So what we've done here is for a reduced sample of the borrowers, and these are the ones coming from the credit unions that have the cleanest uh, and most detailed data, what we can see is actually what fraction of the control group would have had a rate reduction after three months had they been in the Lyft group. Uh, and we can compare that to the Lyft group. So within this set of credit unions, what we see is for the Lyft, 82% of the people at these credit unions uh, received a rate reduction. And the control group from those same credit unions would have had 77% getting that rate reduction, or basically a difference in of five percentage points. Now, in statistical terms, this is what we would call marginally statistically significant. So what you want to think about here is that this is suggestive evidence that the Lyft program improved the rate at which people paid online by about paid on time by about for five percentage points. Uh, the statistical significance is only marginal, meaning that we don't want to uh, we don't want to put super faith in this. But uh, but it does look like there's suggestive evidence that the Lyft was doing what we had hoped that it might do. Next slide. So we can also look at this in the broader sample for all the credit unions, including those where we only have data after a one-year period, uh, at a couple of other outcome measures. And what we have on this slide, uh, we can show the fraction who ever were charged a late fee. Uh, that's 28% for the Lyft group and 33% for the control group. The number of late fees on average, which is, again, slightly higher for the control group, uh, the average late fee amount, and in the final row, maybe the most important thing from a credit union perspective, the fraction who were ever at least 30 days late, meaning that they had really entered a pattern of serious delinquency that may lead to default. And we see that's 15% for the control group and 11% for uh, the lift group. So across all of these dimensions, we're consistently seeing that the Lyft group is showing slightly better loan performance, slightly higher rates of paying on time, slightly lower rates of going into default. Uh, none of these results in the raw form uh, meet traditional levels of statistical significance. So all of these are uh, suggestive results at this stage, but they all go in the same direction that the Lyft appears to have been having a positive effect. We want to put some caution to that result, but, uh, but that's the direction we're seeing. Next slide. So this slide, I won't spend a lot of time. It gets a little overly technical. But we can basically take all of these same measures, and we can run it through something we call a regression analysis, where we can control for the fact that although we have relatively large samples here, for statistical purposes, the samples are somewhat small. Uh, and so we can, can actually control for pre-existing differences between the groups such as they are. So we can control for the interest rate a person got on their loan in a regression analysis. And what you should take away from this slide is in the top row, all of these effects of the, the lift are negative numbers, saying that the lift program, access to the lift program appears to have reduced the frequency of paying late over the first three months, the frequency of ever being late, or the frequency of ever having default. And again, what we're seeing is that all of these results are sort of marginally statistically significant to just under conventional levels. So we want to take, you know, word of caution before overly interpreting, but again, it all goes in this direction that it looks like the lift may have modestly improved these results. Next slide. So if we kind of step back from the, the very detailed things here, we can start thinking a little bit about what the broad implications of what we're seeing from this preliminary analysis of the lift would be. The first one I would say is that, you know, as we just saw, all of these results are pointing in the direction that this lift program targeting on-time repayment appears to have actually done some improvements to the rates at which people were paying on time. So we have suggestive evidence that the lift and a program potentially like this could be su uh, successful. Uh, and in particular, I want to highlight uh, one thing that Leah mentioned earlier is that you know we only see about 40% of people reporting in a survey that they were aware of the Lyft program. So what that means is that the results we're seeing here are likely an underbound for the effect. So had all of the people who had access to Lyft been fully aware of the program, we might have expected to see slightly stronger results. Uh, and so you know we see suggestively positive results, and there's reason to believe they might be kind of understating the potential effect. 
Another sort of broader implication here is uh, that I think this speaks and sort of resonates with something that we've been seeing over and over again in the sort of field of behavioral economics, that uh, small interventions that are aimed around process and focusing attention on performance in a range of financial settings can actually have pretty profound impacts on behavior in ways that we might not expect. So in particular, if you think about the Lyft program, what it did is it offered a modest interest rate reduction uh, on an auto loan. So the incentive here in financial terms was not all that large and actually dwarfed for most people by uh, late fee charges and the effects on your credit score of paying late. So in some ways, these people already had very big incentives to pay on time. And yet, the suggestive evidence here is that this Lyft program improved their on-time payments. And that actually resonates with what we've seen in other settings, that uh, focusing people's attention and really thinking about the process by which we get good financial behavior can have effects, and that we don't want to think about things simply in terms of their overall financial incentive, uh, but that there's a lot of scope for cleverly designed programs and thinking a lot about how people actually behave that can have some positive effects. And the last sort of implication I think we get from the lift comes again thinking back to what Leah told us about this awareness of the lift program. Uh, and I think what we want to take away here is that it helps to highlight one of the really unique challenges of doing this type of research. Uh, so what we see here is that CFSI as the funder of this program and Filene in Wisconsin, we all take very seriously the idea that to really understand whether these programs are effective, we want to run careful randomized control trials. But there's a fundamental challenge in that doing that forces you to operate in ways that aren't fully consistent with the way a commercial enterprise would normally operate. So in particular here, to randomize the Lyft program, what we needed to do was send people letters and not uh, have, for instance, banners all over all the credit unions uh, promoting the Lyft, because we didn't want the control group to know about Lyft or to be given the Lyft. And so what that likely led to is this sort of lower appreciation for the existence of Lyft than we might see in a full commercial rollout of this type of program. And so I think it's important to remember that anytime we try to test something rigorously, which we all think is important, we also have to be aware of the fact that it causes some barriers to our ability to actually observe what things are going to look like in practice. And I think there's a lot of scope for uh, organizations like the Filene Research Organization and for uh, industry partners that we have for these things to help inform studies of various programs to make sure that we do as close as we can to real commercial rollouts, paying attention to things like marketing, uh, so that we we're able to estimate uh, effects as strong as we can. So I'll leave it off there, and we'll turn back to George, I believe, who will uh, speak a little bit about uh, what he's seeing in his discussions with the credit unions about the implications and sort of the aftermath of the Lyft program. Great, <clears throat> great. Thanks a lot, Justin and Leah. I really appreciate the um, of the process and. Uh, and uh, thoughts related to the implications. Um, the, on, on the next slide, we just have uh, a series of not, not very many lessons learned, but I think they're fairly profound um, and uh, I think merge quite well with what Justin and Leo were talking about. First is that innovation is a very long journey. Um, you know, we've been doing uh, innovative product development uh, with credit unions and for the benefit of the consumer finance industry uh, for about 10 years. And uh, what may start off as a very simple insight and a seemingly simple uh, idea um, is actually very complex and it, it results in a long journey. And that has to do uh, partly with working within a, an industry that is regulated, heavily regulated, and even more so regulated um, within the past uh, several years. So those are um, some of the, the questions. And then, you know, also I think working within an industry where innovation is, is not necessarily a key competency to be extremely successful. Actually, innovation has a, a negative connotation in the financial services sector. Uh, a lot of people associate um, some of the uh, aspects of what went on in the financial crisis as being a result of, quote-unquote, innovative products. So the, the, the first lesson learned, and I think it's one that we've been learning uh, over the past uh, decade or so, is that innovation is a long journey, and in order to instigate change, you need to do um, – uh, programs like this where you, where you have to have some in-depth analysis to understand whether a very simple idea, such as rewarding people for on-time payments, uh, actually works in the marketplace. Um, so that's kind of like the, the, the first big insight. 
Moving down to the second uh, bullet, it's um, kind of along those lines. Is in order to determine whether we can have large-scale uh, adoption of this concept of, of lift, both within the credit union system and also within the larger banking system, is that I think we probably need to do further market testing. Um, is this, this type of analysis, um, as Justin was saying, is, is, is a bit uh, contrived for people that are on the ground. Um, you know, this concept of randomized control trial, uh, I think to everyone in this audience, um, is very exciting. But when you get down to the, to the core of it, uh, there are things that kind of go against the normal operational details of how a financial institution works. I think we, we, we did a great job of, of working through these things, uh, but perhaps the next phase of uh, testing uh, of, of the LIST project uh, will be more around, hey, how can we innovate around what are the rewards for the LIST? Is it not just an interest rate reduction at the end of the loan? Is it uh, perhaps more frequent and smaller uh, types of rewards uh, to, to positively um, uh, reinforce uh, the, the right types of behavior? Is it different types of communication uh, channels? And, you know, quite honestly, uh, within uh, the, the technological constraints of a lot of financial institutions, how do we make Lyft um, or products like this um, more turnkey? Um, and I won't get into uh, the, the, the vagaries of uh, core processing systems within financial institutions, but they can be limiting for a lot of uh, uh, credit unions and banks in terms of trying to offer um, uh, innovative products like, like the Lyft. Um, the third one, the third bullet point was really from direct feedback from the, the pilot sites, and I think they're very instructive for people, especially um, that are from the financial industry that are, that are listening in today. Um, and the first one obviously had to do with data collection. Uh, credit unions uh, are not used to doing randomized control trials and the uh, requirements of, of data collection in a very pristine way uh, that is required uh, with, with a randomized control trial. So, so the insights from from the credit unions was that the data collection was, was a little bit tricky and difficult. Um, and once again, going back to some of the technical uh, limitations that a lot of credit unions have, was that some of the data that we needed to do the analysis was very difficult to get. Um, second was uh, just around kind of the program effectiveness. Pretty much to the, to the site, uh, they felt as if the idea of the lift was very effective. And they wished they had the tools and the ability to better communicate what it was all about. And once again, this is kind of getting towards the limitations of randomized control trials in a real market setting, is that they really wanted to kind of shout from the mountaintops, hey, we have this innovative product, but we're not allowed to, and we understand why in the short term, but in the long term, we really want to be able to do this. Uh, the third insight was that this test uh, occurred during uh, a time when lending uh, was not very robust, both from the uh, financial institution side and also from a consumer demand side. Each of the, of the pilot uh, sites were able to issue uh, 200 loans um, in, in the auto lending market, so uh, we, we eventually got there. But um, one, one can wonder uh, how the results may have been different in a different economic environment. So the timing of the lending test um, was, uh, was just an interesting um, kind of background mechanism. Uh, and then finally, lots of suggestions from the pilot sites for more tangible rewards and communication strategies. Um, uh, as I said before, they were really chomping at the bit to um, perhaps offer something a little bit more sexy in terms of reward other than 25 basis point um, rate reduction at the end of the loan, uh, and then obviously around the communication channels. And this really has to do with on-the-ground uh, local native knowledge of what their, their members of, of their credit union will react to in a positive way. So I saw uh, this type of feedback as being very positive because uh, the credit union, once again, they thought that the program was very effective, but it could be even more effective if they were able to tweak the rewards and the communication strategies uh, a little bit. So I'll stop there. Um, and I believe the, the, the next person up to, to kind of weigh in on the results of the LIFT project is uh, my, my good friend and colleague, uh, Josh Sledge from um, CFSI. So I'll pass it on to Josh and hopefully talk to you all uh, during the Q&A portion. So Josh, it's all yours. Great. Thanks, George. Um, uh, appreciate the opportunity to speak with everyone today about the, the results of, of the LIFT project. Uh, if you go to my first slide, I just want to start out by providing uh, a little bit more background as to how my organization, the, the Center for Financial Services Innovation, uh, came to be involved with the, the LIFT project. So uh, starting around 2009, we became really interested in learning about the types of strategies and interventions that work best to help people uh, not only increase their financial literacy, but really take that next step and improve their financial behavior. Uh, and that focus on financial behavior is really what we see as the underpinning of this whole idea of financial capability. 
So we started out with some initial research into the field and were really inspired by what we saw. Uh, and this led us to launch uh, the Financial Capability Innovation Fund in 2010. Uh, so the fund's purpose was to find and support innovative nonprofit-led projects that are uh, designed to promote the financial capability of low-income and underserved consumers. Uh, so with the support of a coalition of funders uh, led by the City Foundation and uh, the rest are listed here, uh, we were able to source uh, $1.5 million to support uh, up to six projects that would be selected through a competitive uh, request for proposals process. So after uh, a long selection process, if you go to the, the next slide, uh, we selected five projects, uh, including the, the LIFT program from Filene, uh, each with a variety of different interventions and areas of focus. So some are focused on building savings, others on improving the efficacy of financial coaching or counseling programs, uh, and some, like the LIFT project, were really focused on building credit. So I won't go into the details here. You can find uh, details on the other projects in the, uh, on our website at cfsinnovation.com. But uh, among the group, we really felt that the LIFT program offered some unique merits and opportunities to learn more about effective financial capability strategies. So if you go to uh, my next slide, uh, we've got some of the merits listed here. So. Uh, first off, the LIFT program was a great example of linking high-quality financial products with relevant and actionable guidance, and we see this as a key step in building consumer financial capability. Uh, it's really about going beyond just educating people on what they should do to also providing them with the tools they need to actually take the action um, you're recommending. So uh, Filene's program was unique among the group in that it started out with a product. You usually see a coaching or counseling program in existence that adds a product, but uh, with the LIFT program, we were seeing a, the, the starting point be a product uh, and then adapting uh, that product with behavioral design features that would really push people toward uh, positive financial action. Uh, in that same vein, we were really intrigued by the opportunity to test the impact of offering rewards for good credit behavior as opposed to penalties for bad behavior. And this is that idea of the carrot versus the stick that George mentioned earlier. Uh, currently, much of the credit system in the United States is, is really designed to be punitive. Uh, if you miss a payment, you incur a fee or an interest rate increase. So LIFT offered us a chance to see if you could flip that model on its head uh, by offering benefits that encourage borrowers to take an action that was ultimately good for them, um, as on-time payments can really uh, help to increase credit scores. We were also interested in learning whether the carrot approach uh, could make a viable business model, which would offer provi providers more reasons to try it. Uh, so if the LIFT program was effective in increasing on-time payments, uh, the providers could realize a decrease in costs that are related to delinquency and collections. So if that drop in cost could offset the loss of revenue from reducing the interest rate from time to time, uh, the program essentially would pay for itself uh, and make it sustainable. Uh, and so finally, if that theory of sustainability actually proved to be true, we see that there was tremendous uh, potential for scale. Uh, number one, Filene's reputation uh, and, and the work that they've done in the credit union industry uh, offered a, a very clear pathway to spreading the concept throughout the field. And then we also saw that other credit providers, not necessarily credit unions, but uh, banks or uh, other uh, providers of, of different forms of credit, might be interested in taking up a proven and sustainable intervention that could help their customers pay on time. So if you go to the uh, last slide, I got some implications and uh, lessons learned here. Uh, overall, we're, we're really excited about the prospect of the LIFT program, and we remain excited uh, after seeing the results. Uh, I think there are really some interesting insights to take away from Filene's experience. For one, the suggestive impact of the concept is encouraging. Uh, it seems like there's something to the notion that this, these types of rewards can have an impact on borrowers' timely repayment. Um, I think the finding around LIFT participants having an improved impression of their credit union is really quite notable as well. Uh, we see many financial services providers are still working to find ways to build trust with their customers and figure out ways to, to, let the, help the, to, to suggest to the customer that you know, the, the provider is really on their side. So it's good to know that this type of program uh, can really have that impact in uh, creating that relationship and building trust between a provider uh, and a customer. Uh, the experience also raised some new questions about the LIFT concept. Uh, obviously, the one you know, we discussed already is, is around, you know, are there ways to more effectively communicate with the customers about the, the program and how it can work to their benefit? Um, as George mentioned, we were a bit constrained with the uh, evaluation method. Um, uh, and so by uh, trying some, some different messaging uh, and different approaches outside of the context of a randomized control trial, uh, you know, what does that really do for the awareness of, of the program and the ultimate benefit of the, the customers? Um, and again, as George mentioned, I think different ways to structure the rewards to really make them more salient 
uh, for, for the customers to, to really help people um, uh, understand what the rewards mean in a, in a very tangible way uh, and in a very present way as well. I think there's also some additional questions about the experience of the, the credit unions themselves. George spoke to a few of them uh, already, but you know, do, do they really see this as a potential way to engage with existing clients or acquire new ones? Uh, and in particular, did the sustainability theory really hold true uh, from a, a P&L standpoint, looking at revenues versus expenses of the program? Uh, did that offset actually take place in the way that we had hoped it would? So I think learning more about that provider experience can help us to uh, refine our impressions of the program and the lift concept overall. And I particularly see the provider question as, as an important one as we've seen some industry players actually beginning to experiment with the lift concept or some variation of it. Uh, for instance, Citi has offered a credit card called the Citi Forward card uh, that offers APR reductions for responsible credit behavior, including on-time repayments. Now, the card is targeted toward younger people just beginning to build their credit history, so encouraging these types of good habits can help people to start their financial lives on the right track. Uh, we've also seen some innovators and alternative lenders in the credit space beginning to experiment with the model. Uh, a company called LendUp that uh, offers short-term loans as alternatives to, to payday loans uh, offers lower interest rates and better terms to borrowers who have repaid their loans successfully in the past. Uh, and we've also seen a new player uh, called Rise Credit that's been actually advertising on television uh, on that basis that they lower interest rates as a reward for on-time payments. So really taking the Lyft concept and using it as the centerpiece of their advertising messaging. So the Lyft program and the experience that we've seen here really offers some timely insights into an idea that appears to have some momentum uh, and the potential to take hold in the financial services industry. And that brings me to my final point uh, around innovation and iteration. Uh, what we have so far are some reliable findings about an innovative program and some ideas that offer direction for how to improve it further. So we have to ask ourselves now, you know, how can we build on our experience to create Lyft 2.0 and figure out how we can make the program even more effective knowing what we know now? Uh, this process of iter iterative design is, is really crucial to the innovation process, not only in the financial services industry, but really everywhere. You get an idea and you test it and you refine it and you test it again and you do that on and on until you really have something great. So, again, I'm excited about what we've learned through this experience and, and even more excited to see what the next version of Lyft ultimately looks like. And with that, I will turn it back over to the uh, CFS team. Great. Thank you, everyone. Um, and now we do have some questions um, that have been posed by our listening audience. Um, we have a great one that came in, um, and I think I'll direct this towards George, but you can definitely... Um, send it to one of your colleagues' directions. Um, have you thought about how this might work with residential mortgage loan products or what barriers might come up in that context? Sorry, sorry. Can, can you repeat the question? I, can, um, I, I couldn't make out the, uh, the last part of that question. Yeah. Um, have you thought about how this might work with residential mortgage loan products or what other barriers might come up in that context? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So we use the auto loan um, product as one um, for the test, mostly because that is the, the biggest portion uh, in terms of uh, number of loans um, in, in a credit union loan portfolio. So that's kind of the bread and butter of, of credit unions, and it's a relatively straightforward uh, type of lending product. Um, but I think absolutely the um, you know I, you, you would you would almost be agnostic. Um, to the, the type of thing that you're, you're lending for um, from a theoretical perspective. You know, if it, if it works for a car loan, it would certainly work for a, a home loan. Um, now, when you get into the, to the regulatory environment for a home loan, it's much more complex, and especially um, in this environment with a lot of the, the qualified mortgage uh, types of uh, rules that are starting to come out. You're talking about a much more heavily regulated uh, product, so um, we we haven't looked specifically into how a, a lift type of uh, component would work with a mortgage product, but just from a consumer perspective, I would imagine um, the the demand would be there for something like this because it's a much more long term uh, pro uh, product and it means a lot more to the end consumer um, just in terms of repayment and on time payment. So um, I think that the um, the potential for for other types of consumer loan products. Um, are, are very high. I think just the, the barriers that, that you're, you're curious about would mostly be from a regulatory perspective. Great question. Great. Okay, we have another one. Um, and I'm just going to put this out there 
and um, perhaps this will go more towards um, Justin and Leah. Um, so, or, or George or Josh, actually. <laughs> um, it's kind of a two-part question. Um, to be clear, were these unsecured loans to begin with? Um, and were these loans for, you, for used or new vehicles? More to the point, who do you perceive as the parallel alternative lender for these loans used in this experiment? Um, so this is Leah, and I can, I'll take part of this question, and then I will uh, punt the other parts, um, maybe to, to George, I think. So on um, how many loans were new or used, so that was a data point that we were able to collect, and about 98%, so almost all the loans were for uh, used cars, and then only 2% of the auto loans um, in this project were for um, new cars. And then... As far as the the underwriting and the security, I'm not George. Is that something that you were able to understand from kind of talking with the credit union sites? Yeah, I mean, almost almost every uh, loan is secured by the actual vehicle. So um, you know, with these these are not unsecured loans. Um, like with with most lenders, they'll secure um, the loan with with the actual property. So. Um, Generally, though, you know, re recourse on on a uh, on a used car loan. There's typically not as much security as with a with a new car loan, but that that's typically how loans are procured. And then, um, I think was was the third part related to who are some of the alternative lenders that would be able to provide this type of product? Is it was was that the third part? Yes. Um, <clears throat> Well, you know, I, I know from just analysis of the credit union industry that credit unions lend to people with with um, uh, less than stellar credit. So, this is a product that is is not an unusual one for for many many credit unions across the United States uh, to offer. Um, and I know from a regulatory environment, some of the real alternative uh, lenders, people that are not uh, deposit gathering institutions, um, the regulatory environment for them has tightened. So uh, the market need is, is still there, and there are a smaller number of lenders. So I think that that's one of the reasons why we uh, we, we looked at this as a um, as a product. Um, and interestingly, another product project that we're that we're starting um, here in the next um, month or so, uh, with support from the Ford Foundation, is uh, looking at subprime auto lending and uh, effective ways to. Um, uh, enable financial institutions like credit unions and banks to offer a sustainable um, loan to subprime um, uh, consumers. I don't know, Josh, if you have any anything to add um, on, on that third part. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, I agree wholeheartedly with, with uh, George, your uh, perception of the market. I think the, the other players that we see in the space, uh, a group of, of – um, uh, providers you know, often called buy here, pay here, um, uh, auto lenders. So these are uh, typically small shops where a person can go uh, buy the car um, and get financing in the same space, oftentimes at, at very, very high rates compared to what they may be able to get through a credit union. Um, oftentimes aggressive uh, or relatively aggressive um, collections policies and, and repossession uh, policies as well. I'm not really sure what the crossover is in terms of the, the individuals that may be either credit union members or shopping at a credit union for an auto loan with uh, those that are um, patronizing the buy here, pay here uh, providers. But uh, again, I think the more um, uh, you know, projects like Lyft and, and really any that are thinking about how to more affordably and responsibly uh, provide access to loans for subprime borrowers, I think really um, is a positive thing in light of uh, you know the alternative maybe um, uh, some of the providers in that that buy here pay here market. Um, here's an interesting question: Could the product end up increasing interest rates for borrowers who do not end up qualifying for the Lyft program, since their rates would no longer be cross subsidized by borrowers who pay C paper rates but are A paper performers? Uh, so this is Justin. I can I can try to take that. So, you know, I think that's one of the things that uh, very well potentially could happen, uh, at least to some extent, with this type of product. So one way of thinking about what the lift is doing is that it's sort of doing two things. One, it's giving a direct incentive to change behavior. 
So f to the extent that what Lyft is primarily doing is it's taking a given borrower and giving them a different incentive than they had before, uh, we wouldn't expect that to have that sort of negative spillover that we're asking about in the question. The, uh, the, the alternative, though, of what Lyft is doing is that it's helping to segment borrowers, right? So there is, you know, when anybody with a sort of poor credit score, some of those people are going to be higher risk than others, and this sort of always happens. And one of the things that financial institutions are always trying to do is identify the sort of lower risk individuals. So when you're able to parse them out, one thing that may happen is that the genuinely higher risk people within that set of poor credit scores may eventually end up seeing even higher interest rates than they currently do. So that may be seen as a downside. Uh, but one thing to keep in mind here is that a benefit potentially of something like Lyft and basically this ability to uh, pick out the better risks that we aren't able to observe in this particular evaluation because we didn't do a broad marketing is that the worry is actually that there are a lot of people with poor credit scores who are nonetheless fairly good risks who decide not to get these loan products, basically who decide that for their own level of riskiness, financing is just too expensive. Uh, so those those folks may go with sort of lower quality cars than they may otherwise. They may have to scramble to find other ways of paying for cars because they avoid the uh, financing space. The ability to more finely risk segment in this way could draw some of those people back into the market. So there, you know, there are probably going to be some winners and losers to any attempt that allows you to segregate risks more finely. Uh, and so one of the, the loser side may be folks who are genuinely high risk may start seeing higher interest rates over time if this sort of thing catches on. But there should be a big benefit to those who are genuinely better risk. And it provides this incentive to sort of focus on timeliness and becoming a better risk. Okay, next question. Have you considered the impact a counselor or nonprofit financial coach could play in improving communication of the program, providing an independent resource to help the borrower at times of financial stress, and create a more comprehensive approach to the borrower financial capability that drives increased payment adherence? Yeah, so, so I'll take that one and, and pass it off to my other colleagues. Um, if they have anything to add, that was one of the the number one suggestion the, um, in the in the study from the from the credit union side um, was how to increase the effectiveness of the communication strategy, and it was um, it was definitely along the lines of either partnering with nonprofit credit counseling um, uh, organizations or for the organizations that have in-house personnel was to more fully utilize them and explain the product uh, in greater detail uh, using some of the more effective techniques that they that they've Yeah, and I'd say uh, um, it's, it's, a, it's a great idea, I think, if the resource is available. Um, and I think it also probably depends on the credit union and the, the overall customer base. Um, obviously, having that deeper level engagement with a counselor um, and having the opportunity to go, uh, you know, maybe engage the borrower on a broader spectrum, their, their full financial life, and think about different ways that they can uh, make adjustments or improvements um, can be really beneficial for those borrowers who, who want it. Uh, I think one of the great things about Lyft is that because it is a limited intervention, for those consumers who may not be prepared or interested in a full financial uh, counseling or coaching relationship, uh, it still provides an incentive and a nudge uh, and a product that um, is a little bit lower touch but, but provides some support that may be consistent with a level that um, they, they feel good about and, and they feel comfortable with. Um, so I think, I think, you know, obviously the, the resource of having financial coaching and counseling can be a great benefit for, um, uh, for, for a borrower, but it's uh, probably something that you'd want to consider uh, whether or not it's a good fit and how to structure that relationship in a way that it's really meeting the, the needs and, and preferences of the, the borrower. Great. Thank you, Josh and George. Um, so like I was going to say, we will do one more question um, to kind of wrap up the the question and answer portion. Um, and so I'll kind of do a, a nice broad question to end with. Um, is there continued interest in Lyft from financial institutions? So um, I'll, I'll answer that and then um, again pass it off to my colleague. Yes, yes, the answer is yes. Um, right now it's trying to figure out how to scale uh, quote unquote technology the idea 
Um, so it's a very simple idea in practice. Uh, I mean, in, in concept, but in practice, it, it involves uh, making certain alterations to the core systems, the operating systems that, that banks and credit unions need for their operations. It, it involves trying to build out uh, applications uh, that allow uh, this type of uh, this type of loan pricing to occur. Um, so I think that that's one of the, the, the barriers, um, and that's just mostly a cost perspective, uh, and the fact that uh, banks and unions use so the target. Uh, you know, like I said, we are doing on prime uh, lending being tested. Uh, even more, and there's a lot of demand for figuring out how to make this a really easy plug-and-play uh, product. And um, I don't know, Josh, if, if you have anything to add to that. Yeah, I think, you know, I'm, uh, I remain uh, very optimistic about uh, the potential for the Lyft concept in the financial services industry. I think, uh, one, now that we're at this stage with Filene's experience where we have results on the table and we are, we're able to have this level of discussion about what seemed to work, what didn't, where barriers were, I think that really provides us with uh, uh, opportunity in a moment to open that discussion up with uh, different types of providers, gauge their interests, and get them engaged in thinking about the concept. Uh, but, you know, we continue to see a lot of uh, organizations and, and providers, whether they're, you know, uh, traditional financial institutions or alternative providers, really thinking about how they can use, how they can develop uh, solutions and products that really promote consumer financial health as a way of building their businesses and as a way of attracting uh, customers, particularly as we continue to uh, come out of the financial crisis. Uh, organizations and banks that want to build their reputations um, and are really thinking differently about how to holistically work with their uh, customer base and build that relationship are interested in these types of, of interventions. Um, so I think, you know, there's a lot of potential here. And I think this is, again, uh, kind of that first phase where we got some initial and, and really good data that showed us that there's something here. Um, and as we continue to refine it and, and continue to have those discussions, I, I can uh, totally envision uh, other financial service providers uh, becoming intrigued with the concept and maybe doing some experimenting of their own. Thank you. Uh, I would like to thank George Hoffheimer, Justin Sidnor, Leah Jertsen, and Josh Ledge for their excellent presentation and insights on the topic today. And thank you to the listeners who tuned in. Just as a reminder, the webinar will be archived on the CFS website, cfs.wisc.edu. Additionally, please join us next month on February 19th from noon to 1 p.m. Central Time for our webinar on Leveraging Mobility, How Employment Builds and Protects Family Wealth and Security. Stay tuned for a registration email to come. Again, thank you for joining us and have a great day.